and uh, I am very glad to invite uh, Dr. George Chamberlain, President of Global Aquaculture Alliance, who has joined us now. And uh, uh, thanks, Dr. George. Welcome back to the program. And you'll also be joining us as a panelist. And we also have Mr. William Prigel from Shrimp Insights, uh, who also presented on the market, mm -hmm. European market yesterday. He will also be joining us as a panelist. Well, uh, we'll go back to the uh, panel discussion. Before uh, Mr. Samson Lee, you are there with us? Yes. Yeah, you are there. And uh, Mr. Paresh Shetty, yes, he is there. Mr. Harris, you are there. And uh, who else? Uh, yes, Dr. George, welcome. Welcome back to the panelists. Good morning to you. Yeah, always a pleasure. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. And I also welcome uh, our past president, uh, Mr. Avik Mailanki, is there. And uh, also past president, Mr. Muthakarpan, as well as uh, Dr. Arun yes. Suresh, our president. Welcome to that. Uh, how I would like to go ahead on this uh, panel discussion is, we have received a few questions to the panelists, to the speakers. Uh, I would like, I have taken a few important questions and I would like to uh, address this question directly to the uh, speakers, let them answer. After that, we can get into the panel discussion, so very important thing. Uh, after these questions are, what, as a moderator, what I would like to look upon is, apart from we have learned what are the production in each country in Asia at this moment, taking clue from Dr. George's uh, suggestion yesterday on the avocado uh, model, how we can make a unified marketing approach for shrimps from the producer perspective? How can we end the uncertainties for the farmers as well as for the end buyer in terms of fluctuations in price? How this impact can be overcome if at all we make as a, uh, some sort of a unified marketing approach from the Asia as well as from Ecuador? Who should take the lead? What should be our objective and how we should move forward? So uh, I hope this we could have some sort of a discussion, especially with Dr. George's with us. So uh, is William Prejil is here with us? Can yes. you see him? Oh, okay, yes, welcome. Welcome, Mr. William Prejil. Okay, first my questions uh, to uh, Mr. Samson Lee. A few questions have been posted on that. Uh, they said, uh, you talked about intensification in Vietnam. We would like to know, how recent is this intens intensification and how sustainable it is? Taking, uh, people are drawing Thailand's past experience with intensification as an example. And uh, what are your comments about it? Yeah, thank you for the questions. Um, in, in Vietnam, I think we, we, we saw it um, uh, starting in the last couple of years and, and I think rapidly happening in the last two years, particularly uh, two to three years. Um, and and uh, uh, our customer farmers uh, are uh, moving a lot with the help of the industry players, uh, promoting the benefit of uh, all this intensification that I just mentioned. Uh, and feed players uh, are playing a big part of it. Uh, and at the same time, I think also uh, consumer side for the exporter, um, typically in Europe side, I think also kind of driving that in, you know, pushing uh, the customer, uh, the farmers to be more efficient and also more traceability and, and transparency. I think that all happened uh, at the same time, but particularly growing faster in the last couple of years. Uh, whether it's sustainable considering the Thailand uh, situation is an interesting uh, question. Uh, we also have some uh, debate with, uh, with the Thailand um, uh, situation. Actually, today we also have one discussion about that. Um, I don't have the crystal ball, uh, but I think um, uh, at least I think in, from the Vietnam perspective, it has been very successful. The only thing is we're seeing the we're speeding uh, the speed as we see is much faster, and in the foreseeable uh, next few years, we believe that it will be uh, even going faster uh, instead of slowing down. We don't see that trend. Uh, slowing that trend is, is there. That's what we see at least in Vietnam. Okay, thank you very much. The next question is, uh, in 2019 in Vietnam, 
the, somebody has said that the imports have been 234,000 metric tons, whereas the production is about 583 metric thousand tons. So they just wanted to know how these figures match, you know, there's some sort of an explanation. What, what will be your take on that? It is always interesting to look at the Vietnam's uh, figures um, uh, when it comes to local production and, and export. And we know that there's official export channel and uh, there's uh, the channels that we don't know how much uh, is being uh, exported. Um, it is very difficult to, to really see uh, the, the, the import export, uh, the matching numbers. To be frank, uh, we have been uh, looking at various sources uh, from the banker, from the industry, from the exporting and receiving, and receiving countries. Um, it's very difficult to say. But what we see is uh, domestic production, except for this year, has been growing. Uh, and, and I think the big part is the domestic consumption, uh, which we estimate at about 30%. That is what we believe uh, the number. Um, and then for India itself, the number that going into Vietnam in the past um, will be very much, I think, will be re-export in some form, uh, probably not only to China. Um, but it's difficult to say, but the numbers uh, uh, is very difficult to reconcile as well. Thank you. Uh, the other question from the producer perspective, uh, you have mentioned about how do you think this uh, functional feeds uh, would be useful for the farmer? It has to be anything to do with uh, specific to do with the genetics or with the growth or uh, how do you see the future of this? How is this going to be helpful to the farmer? Um, not, we, we have um, three types of uh, functional yes. feed and specifically not for the genetic but for the uh, challenge of the of the farmers and the shrimps uh, that undergoing uh, one being that you know uh, uh, we're boosting the weight uh, gained uh, for the animal uh, in, in, in relatively short period of time uh, especially when the shrimp price is becoming better and some farmers want to really get a good result uh, in, a, in a relative short period of time and that's definitely helped farmers uh, to get uh, to grab the opportunity. The other is really on the boosting the immunity uh, of the animal uh, and, and also the disease reduction side. As we know, that I think the shrimp farming, is, uh, we're seeing a lot of challenges uh, in, the, in the diseases in the pond. And we believe also you know, with the intensification, which is like addressing the question that you have come back to the Thailand model, uh, whether it's sustainable or not. We, we foresee that uh, we, will, we will get more challenges uh, and shrimp will get more stressful. When the population in the same uh, area uh, is getting more crowded. So with this, uh, the functional feed uh, and the research and the technology behind that, we definitely need uh, needed for industry. And we believe that, that this can help uh, the farmers a lot uh, down the road. Yes, one last question on that is, uh, again on the functional feeds, people have asked that, uh, because usually the common perception is functional feeds are supposed to be very expensive. And how do you how do you feel look at it as a cost effective measures to provide a good uh, function like a biological function for sure? I, I think that it should not be using to work expensive. I think it's whether it's valuable or not uh, yes. to the farmers. Mm -hmm. uh, you can have very low cost uh, solution, but it doesn't work. And to me, that is very expensive. <laughs> yes, I think to, to the farmers, uh, the most important thing is uh, whatever you put in the pond, whatever you put in the shrimp. It need to be effective and it need to grow, it need to survive. <laughs> at the end of the day, that is, that is still how it works. And, and for, for uh, it, we should look at the value. If we can help the farmers increasing the survival rate, increasing the weight gain, uh, increasing the color, even, you know, uh, help them to build on more value to the next uh, value chain buyers. I think that is uh, what is more important, uh, what is more valuable. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for answering the questions. Uh, now I move to the next speaker, Mr. Paresh Shetty. Uh, sir, you know, you. we have received uh, questions uh, saying that uh, you have uh, mentioned about 100,000 metric ton that will be less this year. And you also said that, you know, in the uh, next three months, the, there's going to be a consistent supply in November and December also, because you have shown us the uh, stocking pattern in the month of August as well as in September. Do you feel that the reduction in the quantity is attributed to the 
lower of average body weights also because some people say the majority of the harvest is less than 15 grams in majority of the area of Andhra Pradesh. What is your comment on this, sir? See, uh, compared to last year, we are comparing that this year the average body weight of the harvester shrimp has uh, been less. Uh, last year, there was a consistency. If you look at um, Gujarat, uh, Bengal, Orissa, they were always about 40, 50, 30 count, 20 count and all. But this year, um, uh, throughout the Indian, uh, where all type of uh, sizes were harvested. Mm. It was majorly due to uh, forced harvest, panic harvest, as well as the disease outbreaks. As a continuous, uh, last, uh, uh, previous year, there was a pattern of disease, like during monsoon time, there was a disease. And uh, after monsoon, there was a disease. But this year, from the beginning, from the lockdown time onwards, Continuously, there was a, there was an outbreak of diseases, less growth, the shunted growth, and uneven sizes. Farmers, uh, when they were doing something, they were seeing no growth at all. So, fearing the, that prices will be less in the future days, they are not ready to wait. Also, they are harvesting more and more. So, if you like, uh, if you see the number of uh, seed stocked compared to last year to this year, it will be more, but the output will be less. That itself shows that the uh, the uh, the uh, average body weight of the harvest shrimp is much lesser than last couple of years, and compared to the first quarter, the second quarter was the second quarter, the third quarter is still lesser. So okay. we are hoping that the last quarter of this year yeah. will stabilize, and farmer will be able to plan his harvesting. Uh, this yes. last two quarter there is no planned harvest. We hardly can see 15, 20 percent planned harvest. Rest yeah. all were either panic harvesting or forced harvest. Mm. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Because this sends a good signal to the farmers as well as to the customers or the empires also. Thank you very much for that. Uh, our next question uh, will be to uh, Mr. Harris. Uh, we have a few questions for you. The export figures which you were given, these are all uh, head on shalom figures because they see that there is a big gap between the production and export. So the, they would like to know what happened to the balance. It's been consumed locally or where does it go? What happens to the quantities? Uh, mostly the export is, is uh, headless and peel. And the gap is because uh, we also have a local market, a domestic market. That mean that, it's mean that uh, we convert from uh, headless to to head on uh, sell on is a sixty percent. It means the, the 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 number is different. It's a big difference, and also uh, our local consumption even during the COVID is not so strong uh, due to the purchasing uh, power. It's still around fifteen uh, percent uh, of uh, production is uh, consumed by locally. Okay. Okay. Uh, you must have. Uh... The next question is, what are the price control measures taken by the Indonesian government and uh, other organizations, and especially yourself, in this situation? You would like to explain that to us? Yeah, uh, of course, we, we cannot control the price. Even government can, cannot control the price. And uh, basically, uh, no organization can control and allow by the government, uh, allowed by the law, because uh, against the law to control to make a control of uh, pricing. Uh, we are very strict on uh, price control regulation. Mm. Uh, but during the during the pandemic of COVID, the government give uh, some relaxation for credit, especially mm. for small uh, scale farm, uh, mm. small scale uh, slim farm. Only relaxation of credit for the bank. Mm. Okay, thank you very much for that. Okay. The other question is, uh, what are the major diseases you, you get confronted in the uh, interrelationship form? Yeah, we have a global disease like a white spot. It's still okay. the biggest threat, the biggest threat for us. But we, on, we also, Indonesia also have a, a specific uh, uh, disease like a IMNV or myovirus that uh, Thailand and also India don't have. And mm -hmm. also white faces disease. And mm -hmm. Even obviously, it's not a declare. Uh, we also have a, a small portion of a, a, a EMS disease. Okay, thank you. 
and you are you are shown that you know your average talking densities are about 100 to 250 pieces per square meter. Uh, some people would like to know what are the major uh, infrastructure changes that are required to meet up with this high stocking densities. Yeah, the major uh, changes, of course, uh, the number of paddle wheel and also the depth of the water. With a uh, 150 to 200, at least the water depth is a 100 uh, centimeter uh, water depth, and the uh, number of uh, HP uh, mm. of pedal wheel is uh, around uh, 70 HP per hectare of pond, or mm. around uh, uh, around uh, 20 HP or 20 pieces of pedal wheel per. Uh, 20, uh, 200, uh, 2,500 to 3,000 3, meters square of the pond. Also, the number of pump, uh, it, uh, because uh, pumping is not so much, not so much different because we mostly implement the less water exchange system, uh, not uh, pro, uh, flock system, but the less water exchange system. That's why the num we're not uh, changing a lot of uh, number of pump, uh, pump uh, power. The only thing we change a lot is the number of pedal wheel. Okay. But Indonesia also, uh, as uh, mentioned about the sustainability, as you know that in the, uh, sustainability and the stock high density, uh, uh, as a, uh, Thailand and also uh, Vietnam have have a problem. We have a lot of uh, pristine area and new area still not exploited area like. Uh, Sulawesi, uh, some part of uh, Maluku, and also in uh, uh, Flores and uh, Timor, uh, that now is uh, uh, progress aggressively. It's, uh, uh, more and more investors from big city like Jakarta and Surabaya move to Sulawesi to find out the new area. Sulawesi, uh, some part of a uh, lot of part of Sulawesi island is still not exploited. That's why we. We considering uh, we, because uh, still new area, uh, people or farmer tend to using or uh, exploiting uh, more and more with the high density. It's a tricky thing, but maybe not safe enough for the long term. But uh, at least for three or four uh, next three or five years, is still okay. To expand. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gabriel, I don't have any specific questions from the participants, but I hope the panelists would have a, a number of questions to be asked to you. So uh, to start with the question and uh, the discussion among the panels, uh, first, I would like to invite our past president, Mr. Avik Mayalanki, uh, to start the discussions and uh, you can point which, what is it, the subject you'd like to take it up for discussion and who's the speaker or for general moderation. Go ahead, sir, please. Thank you very much, Chief. I mean, uh, what we could understand today is more or less uh, all the three countries, Ecuador, India, and Vietnam, are producing similar quantities of, uh, you know, shims. I mean, India, uh, our Paresh Shetty has projected a figure of uh, 655,000 tons or so. And if you go with the figures of uh, gap year, it is coming to about 655,000 this year. And uh, uh, Mr. Samson Lee also has given similar kind of figure. I think I'm not really sure. What was the figure you gave, uh, Samson? For the annual production. Say, sorry, say again. Annual production of? Uh, uh, Vietnam. For, annual production. Uh, yeah, well, 583. Yes, 583. Close to the, close, it, it is export or production? Production. 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 Oh. So uh, Vietnam could be a little less, but uh, Ecuador and India, if you look at more or less the same, because Ecuador uh, exports everything uh, head on whereas India uh, uh, is headless. And what Paresh Shetty has given is about 650 and all that is production, you know. So the top one and two countries are almost at the same level. Of course, India has gone down and Vietnam uh, is at par with last year and slightly has gone down. So there could be uh, something like, uh, you know, uh, about 20% squeeze in the production. Can we arrive at that figure? 15, 20% squeeze in the overall production. I mean, if you like, if you take the overall size of the market as 4 million, and if you're decreasing by, uh, say, about 15%, probably about 600,000, the production is going to be less. And then we can go to Willem and ask, uh, what, what is the demand drop in all the countries put together, you know? 
then we can see whether the supply is uh, supply drop is commensurate with the demand drop you know yeah uh, taking through from Mr. Ravi's comment that if we assume the overall production from individual respective countries are going to be around 20% lesser than previous year, the, the net overall production also is going to be 20% less this year, the, the global production. So uh, would, I, would I call upon Will, I mean, what, what is your uh, account on this? You know, how, how do you like to look at it? Do you think the consumptions would also be less or still the same level? I mean, you can't the, the very... should go off. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the idea. <laughs> that's I, I, the idea. I think this is a very, a very dangerous question to ask and quite a responsibility to answer. Um, <laughs> that's, why we, that's why we're asking you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but first of all, I think that your 20% production drop, I don't, from the presentations today, I don't see it because Avanti was saying 16% for India, I believe. Um, uh, Gabriel, you are saying 6% for Ecuador. No. Vietnam is also no, not no. giving a drop. I'm, my my outlook for Ecuador is 3% more oh. than last year. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Sorry. So even even an increase. In Indonesia is also not um, uh, not producing less than last year, as far as I follow the data in Indonesia, at least. So. Uh, you know, like your question is, is 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 maybe not really relevant because if we are talking about the wrong number, what I'm sure no. about is that uh, consumption in Europe and the US, uh, looking at the current data, you would not expect a drop of more than uh, five to ten percent. Uh, so that would mean if you are right with your twenty percent production drop, that would mean that prices should sustain um, uh, in in a proper way. You know, but. But if you if you might take a little bit more um, yeah progressive view on on the production and production might mainly might maybe only drop five to ten percent uh, year on year, then uh, we might have an equilibrium or maybe even production might increase a bit more than demand. So so I think that is very dangerous to to work with this twenty percent uh, production drop at the global level. I, I don't see it to be honest. No, what, what yes, I said, Rabbi, you like to say something. Yeah, yeah. What, what, what I said is uh, there could be a fifteen percent drop, and you're leaving the other major market, China. There is drop in consumption. You know, I mean, during the lockdown for the first three months, they were not eating in it, and afterwards, after the finding of traces in the uh, packages, the uh, the uh, consumption has dropped down. I mean, if you take Chinese consumption, it is about one one point one million out of four million tons. And there could be a serious drop, you know, right from January, uh, it, it happened between January and March. And again, it started happening from uh, July onwards. Okay. So yeah. why, why, why are you not looking at the drop? And there but, could be but, drop. But year, but year on year, Ravi, I, I don't have the Chinese figures in front of me. I, we, we would need Vincent uh, to, to check. You would, never get, you would never get them for that matter, you know. But we know for <laughs> sure the consumption is about 1.1 million tons, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So there yeah. is a serious drop there. Yeah, but but the data will tell, no, and that's what we still have to see. Like like, is see, that drop I really going to happen? Yeah, you could understand from uh, Gabriel's numbers. See, they were uh, exporting big quantities to China, but this year what happened? It was coming to Europe and uh, US. Yeah, so, that's correct. But yeah, okay. Now okay, there's, I, there's I, I, important there's an important addition sorry uh, to interrupt there's an important addition even though we're all doing the same shrimp the markets react according to the type of product they buy for example when there's a shortage on a on a, on one size that size could increase and the other sizes could drop uh, it's it's size oriented it's also product oriented, right? So Ecuador does a lot of head on, but we also do value added um, in much less quantities, much, much less quantities. But uh, the, the fact that overall shrimp production could be the same or stable from this year to the previous year is in, uh, in a realistic way, it is a decrease from what we were going to export. Mm -hmm. Because uh, Ecuador, if Ecuador exports the same as the previous year, right, the Ecuador tendency was to export 20% more than the previous year. Indian tendency was to export 
maybe 15, 20% more than previous year. So the, our production tendencies were increasing. And even though we're going to export maybe the same as the previous year, the markets were getting ready and we were discounting product already for the past years, for past mm -hmm. three or four years, the prices have been coming down and down and down and that promotes consumption. So it's fair to say that, pro that, that the price discounting has increased consumption in the world year by year, which is a great thing for us, uh, but not necessarily the fact that we are doing the same product as last year. Mm. We still need to see what happens in consumption in the cold weather in COVID, because this year is mm -hmm. a, a completely non-regular year where definitely the cold weather, the restaurants sitting outside, all of those things we have to take into consideration might not be there. There is, there is a definite demand for retail ready products, not so much for head on block frozen products, which is what we do. So on, on that side, maybe your items are going to be hot in the market. My items, not so much because mm. I go to a restaurant who's not selling as much as they were before, whether you where, where you go to a retail who is short on product or who feels short on product on certain sizes, the retail, because the retail consumption has gone up as, as a result of the recent price drops everywhere. And, and that has um, had an effect in consumers where they are going to the supermarkets and buying the products and cooking them themselves. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gabriel. As you were speaking, I received two questions uh, for you from the participants. While we are talking about India and Ecuador is almost a similar production quantity, similar production quantities, they would like to know what is the land area available in Ecuador, scope for expansion, and are you going to follow the intensification models of Indonesia and Vietnam? Because then there's going to be a different ball game in the entire production circle. What is your comment on that? So, okay, Ecuador has 220,000 hectares, 220,000 hectares of shrimp production. And we have had 220,000 hectares of shrimp production for five years. It may be increased from 2000 and to, from 215,000 hectares to 220,000 hectares. So it's an increase of 2% over five years. We are, we are not desperately looking to increase our farm area. So for us, the, the farm area is not where we want to increase. We are trying to be more productive in the same farm, but staying away from intensive programs. Um, the farmers in Ecuador are, are very, very traditional and I, I would say that we, we, our firing expertise has been learned from past generations and it's very low density, non-intensive style. So I don't think that we are going to intensify to a point where it's going to be a problem uh, or, a, or an oversupply in the future. I think that our model for the future is to maybe re reduce the amount of days in the grow out ponds by having uh, smaller uh, nursery ponds uh, available so that you can transfer, 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 and then have less days in the grow out pond. And that's kind of the method we've been using uh, in the last five years for in increasing our, our output. There are still in Ecuador, many farms, many. And I, when I say many, the average production per hectare per pound per year is still about, I think it's 6,000. I, I haven't done the number recently, but it's about 6,000 pounds, pounds, not kilos, 6,000 pounds of product per year per hectare. So that's very, very low output in the, in the, in an average per year per hectare per pound. Okay. Thank you. Uh, when we move on, uh, the other panelist uh, may invite uh, our president, Dr. Raul Victor Suresh, uh, if you have any questions for the speakers or any comments. Dr. Suresh? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Um, 
I, I think, you know, it has been a wonderful uh, presentation by all four speakers. And uh, the comments are pouring uh, from the attendees, you know, saying how good the program has been. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of them. All four presentations were outstanding. And I want to express my gratitude to all of them. And I think, uh, you know, the overall conclusion uh, is pretty clear, you know, is that uh, the production has not been so badly affected. Uh, consumption, with the exception of uh, China, uh, has also been good. So uh, this is uh, unexpected, you know, to, to a large degree. And then, you know, the year is just uh, three months away from uh, completing. So uh, it is good to know that, you know, the COVID has not affected um, the, the overall trends, you know, that much. Um, yesterday, when we talked about the markets, uh, uh, the vice president for uh, events, uh, Mr. Madhusudan Reddy, um, mentioned about, you know, is it COVID versus shrimp, you know, who, who wins? You know, it looks like the shrimp did not do so badly, I think, you know. So, um, so on that respect, um, I, I think it's a good thing. And uh, it, it looks like, you know, uh, all the producing countries, um, we need to work uh, uh, in our respective markets to see what we need to do to improve the prices. You know, that's ultimately uh, going to be the big thing to stimulate uh, further production. And then that then, you know, becomes this point of, you know, the domestic market. Um, uh, I, I think, you know, Samson Lee mentioned about 30% of Vietnam's production going into the uh, domestic market, you know, that's uh, that's a good thing. And that uh, could be a partial explanation. You know, we were talking about, you know, why this disparity between uh, the export and the production numbers, you know, it, it could be part of that, you know, is that there is a, a significant domestic production uh, consumption. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, it goes into that ultimate uh, thing, you know, how do we stimulate uh, consumption? I think uh, Dr. Chamberlain is here and uh, he, he's going to reinforce, you know, what he talked about yesterday about you know, how do we get the marketing? You know, how do we do the, the marketing? And I, I, you know, even yesterday's uh, Mr. Rubio's presentation, you know, he, he mentioned, you know, how this promotion, even though COVID has, you know, diminished the prices, uh, it still is a good thing because it is now helping the consumers to take shrimp home and cook it, you know? So uh, post COVID, you know, when you look at uh, uh, a year from now, you know, if the retail sales, you know, uh, sustain their trend, and if people are young people, particularly young people, are cooking, you know, more shrimp, uh, that's a good thing for us, you know, for our sector. So, uh, so in all, I, I think, you know, the COVID has done something good for our industry, um, uh, you know, in, in, in this respect. So uh, that's sort of my take home lesson, you know, from these two days of uh, webinar. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Suresh. Thank you, Minister. And we have a question for Mr. Samson Lee. Uh, so, someone would like to know what is the projection for Vietnam the next coming years in terms of production? Yeah, as um, as I explained in the in the presentation, we expect that in this year's drop of roughly about nine percent, uh, cool. and that is going to pick up uh, next year fastly at ten percent. So we kind of reshape yeah. rebounds if everything goes well, of course. Uh, uh, and the COVID is not haunting the uh, furthermore. Uh, then I think uh, it will come back to a pretty healthy uh, growth rate about, you know, 3% plus minus uh, for a normal growth rate for aquaculture uh, in general. So um, that okay. is, that is uh, what we see. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, may I wait from other panelists, Mr. Sachs yeah. Chako, would you like good to good bring in our good Mr. Kumaresan, this is. Uh, uh, yes, Mr. Kubereson, go ahead. I, I have one question for Mr. Gabriel Luna. Yes, first you introduce yeah. yourself so they know. Yeah, so I am Kumareson, yes. senior DGM from Sherlong Feed Company, Sherlong Biotech India. So I have he's one also, question. He's also executive member of SAP. SAP, yeah, yeah. Yes. So I have one question, uh, sir. You told you follow the lunar period for harvesting the shrimps. Uh, I think you will follow that uh, molting graph of shrimp. I hear that Ecuador, you will follow that uh, molting graph, graph, molting curve of shrimps before deciding the harvest. Uh, can you brief about it? It will be useful for our farmers. Um, 
I, I, let's see if I understand that the, the question is, how do we harvest or, or what, yeah, what how, is the... How, uh, how, how, how is you decide the harvest or, based on okay. the molting graph of shrooms? You told the lunar period, no? It's related with the molting. Yes. So yeah. what we do, it's more than a molting graph. It, it's not, it's not yeah. a molting graph, but it's a, it's a lunar cycle. And why it's a lunar cycle? Because when the, when the moon is full or the moon is a new moon, the gravity pull is what makes the tides in the ocean go higher or lower than normal. Okay. Ecuador's farms are at sea level, at yeah. sea level. And a lot of the initial farms back in um, 1980s, 1985, were right next to the ocean. So if this is the ocean and your tide is not moving, you cannot uh, clear out your pond. You cannot, yeah. you cannot by gravity let the water out. So okay. that's what forced us into this natural cycle of harvesting with the moons is that our farms are at sea level. So most farms or a lot of farms actually need the sea level to decrease lower than usual during the harvest, during the full moon or the new moon, because that's when the tides move more. And that's when we can let the water out. Water, of yes. the so, so that's how it started. Yeah, okay. That's yeah. that's how it started yeah. so, the, yeah. the cycle of the of the moons, but and then we throughout throughout the years we experienced that during that lunar cycle during that full moon or that new moon is when the shrimp are the texture the hardness of the shrimp are at best for harvesting. That's what we found for us. Okay. So this is Thank to facilitate facilitate the drainage, drainage of yes. water. Yeah, it's complete draining of water. So it's uh, not related with the molting graph. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. Thank so, you. Uh, yeah. Thank, if, thank you. If any, if any, any more questions from the panelists, uh, we'll have one question. If not, uh, I would like to move to the modified marketing approach because, as Dr. Chamberlain said, we can make use of the next thirty minutes effectively discussing about that. Uh, yes, we have one question from panelists, Mr. Madhusudan Reddy. Yes, please go ahead, sir. I would like to ask uh, George Chamberlain. Regarding this domestic marketing, you know, what he was mentioning, trying to push domestic marketing in India is, is a tough ask for us. What if we invest a lot of money and try to promote, you know, more consumption in countries like, you know, Vietnam, Indonesia and Thailand, so that, you know, our farm gate prices can pick up. You know, precisely that is a discussion we want to bring in as a unified marketing approach. <laughs> that we, we, we will cover that. I hope Dr. George will cover that in our discussion. Okay. Okay. Any, any, any other question, Mr. Saji? Okay. Uh, then uh, my invite, uh, Dr. George, uh, would you like to again say a few words about the avocado model? and uh, say what is it you have in mind on the uh, unified marketing approach for the shrimps which you explained us yesterday please go ahead please uh -huh. okay well thank you very much i i i'm afraid what i have to say is really going to be a repeat of what uh, we discussed yesterday but i think it's reinforced by the discussions today about production so you know basically what we've heard is that production is doing well. Uh, Ecuador is uh, just doing fantastic. Their, uh, their breeding program, breeding animals that are actually um, from the pond environment uh, so that they have immediate resistance to disease, but also improving in growth rate and Ecuador's improving its um, production technology uh, using auto feeders and in some cases a little bit of aeration and um, anyway we see um, uh, the pr progress in Vietnam with the intensification and I think that that's not just Vietnam that's in Malaysia that's in Thailand we see it in Brazil we see it in Peru this uh, intensification model to me is really exciting because we're, um, we're 
uh, taking another step toward control. It's all about control. You know, if you go back to the earliest days of shrimp farming centuries ago, uh, there was no control. It was all about using mother nature, you know, wild post larvae, a very natural impoundment, uh, natural foods. Uh, but with that came predators, competitors, diseases, all these other issues. And you had very unpredictable and very low yields. But over the decades, step by step, the controls have been added. And we're basically learning to industrialize the process. We're, we're moving from a wild to a controlled process. And we're on this journey. You know, we, we only see the present. You know, we see the, this part of the journey uh, and, and we think that's pretty controlled, but it's, we're nowhere near where we're going to end up, you know. And uh, when, to me, you know, everybody has their own views, but when I look at the intensification process, I see that as a much farther step down the road. And I see it um, um, as adding consistency and predictability and it enables new things, you know. For example, um, waste control. In these small controlled units, you can effectively remove all the waste, which controls disease. And since you don't have disease, you can control disease in these systems. You can breed just for growth rate. So we see animals that are getting, instead of you know, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 average daily gain, maybe 0 0.4, 0 0.5. It's incredible and it's not finished. Um, even things like lighting. You know, I was speaking with the Phillips Lighting Group and they're reviewing the literature and they say, you know what, with the proper photo period and intensity and spectrum, actually the, the light can improve growth rate by 20 or 30%. Imagine, we haven't even thought about that. And then there's the mineral balance of the water, making sure the calcium and the magnesium and the potassium balances right. So the controls, I see that as the future. Anyway, the whole point is the technology is improving supply is increasing, the cost is going to, going to go down a little, but the supply is going to very quickly outstrip consumption. And, and we come to this problem of how far is the industry willing to go to discount prices in order to increase consumption, or is it time to begin marketing? <laughs> <laughs> and if you look at all the other commodities, you know, uh, I tried to point out yesterday uh, that the U.S. Department of Agriculture has what are called marketing boards for 22 commodities. Just about everything you can think of, you know, poultry, eggs, beef, uh, uh, milk, um, soybeans, uh, potatoes, corn, all of the nuts, pistachios, walnuts, fruits, cherries, mangoes, you know, all of these commodities, all of these things have some organizational structure to improve marketing and, and data collection and quality control. And we specifically discuss the avocado model because it is so uh, similar, you know, um, about 15 years ago, they started and the problems with avocados were very inconsistent uh, quality in the market. Some were overripe, some were very green and hard as rocks. Um, no good data on uh, how much product was coming in and how big the market was. And then a big concern among consumers that avocados were actually not good for you. The, it caused heart problems. And they joined together, formed a marketing board. They, every bit of avocado, every pound, every kilo of avocados entering the U.S. market, uh, the exporters paid a small fee, but it's even. Everybody pays the same amount. It's not a competitive issue. Everybody paid. In their case, two and a half cents a pound. Oh, you add all the pounds, that's an enormous amount of money. 
And that went into supporting research and they discovered, wow, the fats and avocados are actually good for your heart. And so it ended up with the heart healthy endorsement of the American Heart Association. And while they have all this data, now they know exactly where the peaks are of, of consumption and demand and they can time supply and demand. And they developed all sorts of new product forms, you know, not just uh, guacamole, but avocado ice cream, avocado toast, avocado smoothies, avocado salads. Av these days, avocado everything. I think I probably uh, have contributed to the per capita consumption because I'm crazy about avocados. Anyway, it's, it's um, and they have managed to nearly double the per capita consumption in the last six years while keeping prices firm. And in the case of shrimp, the per capita consumption in the US has been flat for about 15 years. So could we do something like that? Now, in this discussion, you know, now Gabriel was uh, in on that Ecuador discussion. He saw the presentation by, um, by Alan Cooper and, um, and joined in that, those initial uh, discussions about forming a, a marketing <clears throat> committee. Um, but one of, one of the big challenges is we have different markets. It's not just the U.S. It's also China. It's also the EU. How do we work across the board? Well, don't get the impression that the avocado guys are only working in the U.S. They have the World Avocado Organization, and they have, you know, the appropriate marketing mechanism in each of those areas. And, and that should be the objective of the shrimp marketing campaign. But the, I guess the question is, where do you begin? Which, is the, which market makes sense to begin? And then you can grow into the others. And my, my proposition would be the US market because we already have these marketing boards. It's the major market for India. And it, as Gabrielle says, it probably should be a, a larger portion of the market for Ecuador just to hedge its bets and not be too dependent on one supplier now or one buyer. Now I've um, uh, just uh, I just realized that it would have been great to actually have Alan Cooper in on this discussion since he has been so directly involved in the both the avocado and the shrimp business. And I've tried to uh, text him in Peru to see if he might join us. But unfortunately, I can't seem to get him on this very short notice. But I'm sure we could arrange it as a separate uh, discussion at whatever point we all wish. So let me, uh, let me pause there. I don't wanna monopolize the conversation. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Chen. Yeah, yes, Mr. Ravi, just before I go come to you, a few questions come on the question board, uh, which you need to address to the participants. This question is to uh, Mr. Samson Lee. So uh, there's a question saying that, you know, uh, what's happening with the WFS, white fecal syndrome in Vietnam, or uh, is uh, anything Europus is doing towards it uh, to look at this particular disease in terms of your uh, prophylactic measures like a functional feed, whatever it is. Any comments on this? Definitely, and, and that's that's a very common disease in shrimp, and uh, not only happened in Vietnam. And, and we have been working long uh, for this uh, with our functional feed. Uh, mm -hmm. on that. uh, and, and that's again, uh, this this is this is more a precaution basis. Um, so you have to do, you know, it is it's quite seasonal uh, uh, outbreak, and you know that uh, you have to do it in advance uh, mm -hmm. before the outbreak. After the outbreak, it's always more difficult to uh, to contain uh, the situation mm. that uh, through the functional feed and growing the healthy stream in advance before uh, the, the outbreak is always uh, critical. I think uh, you have to couple couple with the product as well as the practice. Uh, okay. okay, thank you. The, the, they have an, you have another question in terms of in uh, the spread of farms in uh, in Vietnam. We're talking about intensified farm. Those who are 250 pieces more per square meter. What is their percentage compared with farms which are doing less than 100 pieces per square meter? 
and uh, do and uh, what is the importance of nursery everybody goes for nursery in vietnam or how, how, how does it happen there in vietnam now now in just in reason one two years is going to uh, two three step uh, as nursery as you mentioned uh, farming that seems to be quite uh successful uh, and welcoming model in the last uh, especially one two years um, and and in terms of percentage we see that it's super super intensive one that uh, more than 250 300 uh, one is only less than five percent more or less uh in, in our calculation uh the majority of the of the uh, intensive one will be uh, still around uh, 50 60 percent uh in, in our in our numbers Okay. But definitely going, going uh, past that. Okay. Yes. Good. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gabriel, you have a question. They said uh, the offer prices in Ecuador is so low at the moment. Do they say it is below the cost of production? That's a very good question. Uh, at the moment, we are not uh, below the cost of production. Um, we are we are at it depends it depends what goes into the cost of production because if if you count uh, financial costs if you if you count uh, risk factors if you count maintenance if you count a lot of those things we are under uh, or we are barely breaking even and and this is very dismotivating for the farmers as as i think it probably is in many areas of the world um mm -hmm. There are some farms that are very cost effective. There are some very extensive farmlands here that are very old that can probably have some some good numbers, but it's not a lot of volume. So it's it doesn't mean that there's there's millions of dollars to be made if you're doing extensive farming. It's it's small production, small profit. So it's a uh, it's a difficult question, but we are we are borderline at our cost. Um, there have because the 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 low prices of the market um, are one thing, but then the prices to the farmers are a different thing because of the way it works here, which I think is very similar to the way it works in India. Is that the packing plants set out a list of prices for the internal market? That internal market varies depending on the amount of shrimp available during that week or during that harvest, right? So if, our, if, if that week in particular, there is a lot of harvest, there's a lot of shrimp coming out and the packing plants get full quickly, then the prices can come down and it hurts the farmers because the packing plants are full. In the past weeks, it has been the opposite way. It has been that the prices to the farmers are not reflecting the prices outside because they are higher inside of Ecuador than they are in the actual market. So in today's internal market, the, the farmers are having a, a I, I would say some profit, but it's not relative to the sale price. It's the packer who is losing the money. Somehow there's, there's two markets. There's the market that the, the Ecuador exporters sell at, which is the market at which you can place shrimp in Europe, USA, or China, an average of those numbers, right? And then it all depends on how much raw material is available. If the internal, if the internal processing capacity was ready and was prepared for a growth this year of 25%, means that the processing capacity was already expanded to take on a production of 150 or 160 million pounds per month. But in the market internally, there's only 100 million pounds. So that means that the packers must fight for shrimp in order to have their factories full, right? And this is to an advantage, this is an advantage to the farmer at the end of the line because the farmer is getting more of the actual final price. Okay, thank you. Mr. Ravi? You like you wanted to step in, please. Go yeah, ahead. I mean, uh, I have uh, a point to add to Gabriel. What he's trying to uh, say is the two uh, different market forces, you know, uh, global market forces and the local market forces, local supply demand. Not two markets, two market forces. Okay. 
Yeah, yeah. And uh, I wanted to ask a question to George. It was great uh, listening to you, George, again today as well. Uh, and uh, I, I wanted to know how who is financing uh, this uh, unified marketing board, and uh, how is uh, avocado industry structured? Is it fragmented uh, as ship, or it is not as fragmented as ship? Mm. Well, I'm afraid the um, the marketing initiative, to my knowledge, has. Um, has uh, wound down to uh, no initiative at all. <clears throat> so it, basically what happened there, it, it all comes down to who's going to pay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. And everybody loves the idea as long as someone else pays. Uh, but um, that's why voluntary systems don't work because uh, no one wants to pay. Uh, I think the U.S. importers would have loved it if the exporters would have paid. And I think the exporters would love it if the importers would pay. Uh, or maybe the government <laughs> would pay, you know. So everybody's looking for someone else to pay. Um, and, and that's why the mandatory model is attractive because everyone must pay a very small amount. But then the, the, the issue that came up Robbie, is that the mandatory USDA marketing board, um, it, it raised the question with the importers of whether the US Department of Agriculture, since it was involved in shrimp marketing, might be tempted to move into shrimp regulation. And the importers were worried that this could be inviting another agency to regulate the, the shrimp business and that scared them. Now we talked to, to experts. We actually had someone, an expert who had experience with the soybean checkoff program. And he said, no, no, no. These are totally different groups within the U S department of agriculture. They're, uh, that's, um, that's not an issue. And it's not, never happened with the other groups and you shouldn't be concerned. But nevertheless, that, that I think caused uh, some fear among the importers and resulted in the, uh, the concept not being further uh, pursued, I regret to say. I think it needs another jump start to get going again. Um, and then in terms of how fragmented the avocado industry is, I'm afraid I'm just not able to answer that. My, my guess is that it's probably uh, consists of larger players because I can't imagine, uh, you know, somebody with just a few avocado trees uh, competing in that business, you know. So, um, but once again, we would have to bring in an expert to answer that one. Thank you, Rob. Okay. Thank you. Because you just yeah, answered I, I, because there was a question about uh, who should be... Uh, who is going to build a cat? <laughs> there was a question on the on the panel. Should we talk to exporters? And you know, you have you have clear uh, answer. Yes, Mr. Gabriel, you wanted to say something about it. Uh, yeah, I wanted to to add something. The the idea of a marketing strategy is to to me personally as a farmer is a great idea all around. Right. Um, if we do it by numbers and just figure figure this very quickly, the U.S. imports 1,600 million pounds every year. That that's about correct. 1,600 million pounds every year. I, I I'm talking out of the top of my head, but maybe George, if you could check that out. <laughs> um, okay. That that per capita consumption has been for 20 years four pounds per person per exactly. year, four pounds. But each person on protein eats 220 pounds per year. So 220 pounds per year is what a person eats in protein in the US, counting meats, poultry, turkey, uh, fish, all other products, right? Only four are shrimp, which is healthy, a heart good, um, it's a nice protein. It makes you lose weight if you eat it properly and you don't bread it and you don't eat it with mayonnaise. 
so it, it's, it's a very healthy protein. It's sustainable for the future of the, of the farming industry, of the, of the um, eating industry. I mean, it's, it's, it's a healthy food for the environment. It's a healthy food for the person. Right? And I think our story of how we have all over the world changed our farming strategies to become a, a sustainable, a, a more natural, a more clean production is a great story that people do not know other than the people who are involved in the business. We know it, you know it, um, the, the people who work for the industry know it, but the people at home, the people who are going to the retail shops do not know it. They still have that bad image from the past. Now, it has to, it, in my opinion, I've heard uh, Mr. George's comments that uh, the importers don't want to pay for it. And at the end of the line, whoever pays for it is the same person, is the producer. Because wherever you put it, wherever you put that money, if, if you take it from the exporter, from the importer, from the farmer, or from the final consumer via tax, however you, you wish, this is all non-legal talk, of course, but however you wish to, to put it, um, it all comes down to, it's gonna be added to the producer. They have, the producer has to pay for it because you're the one, or we are the one, I am the one, who wants to sell more product. Now, in the market, why starting in the US is a great, great idea? Because it's a market with measurements. It's a market where you have a clear way to identify that your dollar had a return, right? It's, if, if we do it in China, we don't know what the return is because China is already growing in their consumption. So did, did our millions of dollars in marketing have an effect? really or was it just china already increasing their consumption in the us we have a number if we if we all in the world producing world get together and via exports pay for a campaign somehow right and then people will say well why why am i going to pay for india's campaign I say well if somebody eats one more indian shrimp that means that they will demand one more ecuadorian shrimp at the end of the day whoever <laughs> eats more shrimp it doesn't matter from where it is, there's one shrimp that has been eaten. So I need to fill in that hole. Right? Okay. So it will benefit all of us at the, end of the, at the end of the line to have a marketing campaign. Thank you, Mr. Gabriel. Uh, before I move to Mr. Harris for a couple of questions, I hope Dr. George will recollect maybe 12 years back when the Vanami started coming from South America to uh, Thailand. Mr. Itamar Roka from Brazil, you know, and we had a discussion like, why not you have something like an oil producing and exporting countries? Oil producing countries decide the price. Why can't the producers can decide the price? But of course, it was too early to have this discussion at that time. I think so. Yes, and I think, I think you, there you're getting into uh, very dangerous territory, Santana, when you talk about controlling price. I don't think that's actually what we're trying to do. We're just trying to increase consumption. Mm. And mm. price will be what price is. And I think um, in almost no commodity do producers control the price. I, mm. I, think, uh, I think that was the objection then. Is, yes. Yes, that, that yes. controlling price, uh, first of all, gets into lots of, of legal issues. But... Um, promoting consumption because yeah. shrimp is such a wonderful product and there's so many it's so versatile and there's so many positive attributes and, and with a little more research we can take the health issues off the table and maybe reverse them as they did avocados i want to thank gabrielle excellent points that you just made yeah thank you for thank that you. thank you dr george i wanted you to say this because the same thing you said 12 years back you said that don't get into price control. This is dangerous. Get into consumption. <laughs> That's what is going to drive the business. Yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Harris, a few questions for you. In Indonesia, what is the type of a salinity range the farmers are working there? Number one. Number two, what do you feel about these functional feeds in Indonesia? Are they in circulation? The second, the third one is on the feed. I, it, it seems that there's, there's a lot of uh, 
low cost uh, feeds which is being sold in indonesia uh, what is your take on this how does a farmer benefit or it impacts the environment or what is your take on this please thank you thank you um firstly about the salinity for farmer intensive system in indonesia um, mostly farmers uh, to find uh, to find the location that the salinity is ranges between 15 to 25 ppt uh, for during uh, culture period secondly about the, i have to say about the, uh, about the uh, tendency of trend in indonesia today uh, intensification and move to the new area like sulawesi is very very uh, uh, common practice now but uh, our scientists and also some government official uh, keep talking to us to to follow the model of uh, ecuador and india in terms of decreasing the uh, stocking density but farmer uh, rejecting the idea, idea and keep increasing the uh, stocking density with uh, some calculation and reason behind the decision uh, the, the second tendency is uh, that a farmer uh, stream industry stream feed industry you now is uh, providing a low crude pro uh, protein is for 30 uh, 30% of crude protein even for intensive system until 150 to 200 pieces per meter square it's a uh, it's it's tricky and a long time before we had to accept the idea that intensive system <coughs> using the uh, crude protein of 30% but now the more and more farmer almost Uh, like our company of CJV, this almost 50% of uh, fit share of sales is coming from the low protein level of 30%. Uh, 30%. But uh, now, uh, as uh, disease like the white spot uh, myovirus and also uh, white feces diseases, more and more outbreak in Indonesia, this uh, uh, functional fit is also also the technology that farmer awaiting a uh, long time before rubes introduced the functional feed in indonesia and now cj also last couple months introducing the uh, functional feed with a low price uh, it's a quite similar with the premium grade of the intensive uh, feed it's about 1.1 or 1.2 of a us dollar it's quite cheap compared to Uh, compared to functional feed uh, from other brand. Uh, thirdly, uh, I have to say about the uh, nursery pond. Uh, uh, a trend of nursery pond also uh, also arise in Indonesia, but after trial and trial and error and error, farmer, I don't know reason behind uh, the 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 the. Uh, what happened in a uh, nursery pond was uh, a lot of farmer trying of a uh, one step to two step farm but uh, transferring from one step to st uh, two step of farm is uh, almost 95% is failed it mean that now the nursery pond uh, more and more farmer uh, left the nursery pond and using a normal uh, uh, grow out pond in one stage uh, that's it That's our, our answer for uh, uh, Madam Zurida. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I have a thank you, Mr. Harris. I have a question for uh, Gabriel. Uh, you know, what do you feel about you have been substantially exported to Europe because you know you have the second COVID attacks in UK, uh, and uh, how do you think this will impact uh, your exports to uh, European Union? That's the first question. Second question is uh, your other neighboring uh, South American countries as well as Mexico. You know they're all producing now. Uh, one of my share. How do you find the growth in these countries? Uh, any any uh, inputs would be useful. For that. Yeah. So the the first question is how uh, how the COVID would impact in the future of the our sales to Europe? And yes. It, it's a little bit of a guess. Uh, it's it's um it's a mixture it's a mixture of did they already buy enough shrimp? for their holiday season when the price was low because you have importers and you have consumers and there there is a difference and you have to always think of the difference um, between demand from importers and demand from consumers 
what we want as farmers is demand from consumers because that's demand that eats the final product and disappears it. Demand from importers when the price is low stores the product and creates a future problem, right? So, so to answer that question, I really don't have a clear answer because I don't know if the product that we already shipped is stored or has been eaten. And I would have to say based on previous numbers that there is a good amount of product already stored, but also um, we have been so competitive that maybe our product has been used more than other products. Now, India's exports to Europe were down and we have been peeling more product than ever in the past four months, right? We have been doing more value added. Of course, we cannot change our matrix of production immediately. And we cannot say that everything we are exporting is value added. We are nowhere near that. We're not even 40% value added. So um, it's, it, but some of that increase in exports are value added exports, which are going to the supermarkets who were short, which were eaten already. So I, I would think that it's going to be stable for the rest of the year in Europe. Um, and not only, not only that, but the prices were so low and they're starting to go up that they might be motivated to pick up some more inventory before the prices continue to go up to a regular market price. Because on all commodity items this year, they were all hit with some sort of COVID price, right? Either production was low, so or or pe uh, factories didn't have people, so you couldn't process, and it wasn't really a market issue, but it was a production issue, and the prices dropped more than they should have. There's always these corrections. Everybody's afraid on a year like this to take a position on inventory if the if the prices are dropping and dropping. You don't want to take a position on inventory until you see it bounce back up. When it bounces back up, you say, okay. Now I'm going to take a position in inventory because now it's going up. So there is a increase in demand from importers during these next few months because they are seeing the price go up a little bit, right? So they say, well, it's time to step in because the bottom already hit and we already bounced back up. That's, that's the, the first part of the Europe question. The, the second part of the question, can you repeat it? I, I completely forgot, <laughs> sorry. Uh, they said, what about the production in other South American countries, including Mexico? How do you see the growth in these countries? Okay, so Mexico's had a, a good year so far um, in their producing. Mexico is the, the second largest South American producer uh, by far. Um, I think it's I think followed, followed by maybe uh, Venezuela or uh, something like that. Um, but Mexico's production is healthy, is strong, but they have had a great internal market reaction. Their internal prices in Mexico are higher than the prices in the US or than in Europe, which means that they are not motivated to export product. They are motivated to keep it in Mexico for their local consumption, which is a great consumption. They are great cookers of seafood in general. So they, they have a lot of recipes, a lot of dishes, a lot of um, consumption internally. Now that, even though that has happened, even though COVID has wiped out the tourism to Cancun and all the beaches and all the all-inclusive hotels and Mexico is a very tourism oriented country. So as, as soon as tourism starts to pick up, if COVID starts to slow down in the world, um, we could see a Mexico turnaround where they're be becoming a more consumption oriented country than a producer exporter oriented country in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kenya. So, you know, uh, we are almost coming to the close of the session, but before we end, uh, I would like to draw the attention uh, for the participants. You know, everybody, every country we are facing the issue of uh, White fecal syndrome, WFS. Okay, so uh, I call upon Dr. George to talk about the recent paper published uh, on the WFS in Venezuela. Uh, any uh, 
inputs for us as a take home message for us on WFS. Yes, Dr. Josh, please go. Yes, I, I, I recall someone uh, raised the question about white feces um, and uh, Haris mentioned that it's, it's a major problem in Indonesia and I think it's a, a problem really throughout Asia. Um, but I wanted to draw attention to a paper that was just published this month uh, by the University of Arizona about an incidence of white feces in Venezuela. And it's the, you know, the first uh, reported case. And, and once again, there's a strong correlation with EHP. EHP, very high correlation of EHP uh, and white feces. And it seems like um, the, the issue here is that it's not a 100% thing because EHP, the presence of EHP tends to open the door for opportunistic bacteria that cause something called SHPN, septic hepatopancreatic necrosis. So the combination of EHP, a small parasite, uh, leads to a bacterial infection and then to white feces. But I think this calls to, uh, calls to mind two issues. Number one, you know, reported incidents of EHP now and white feces in Latin America and, um, and a recognition that white feces is really most likely driven by EHP. So, um, I know there on the breeding side, there, there are some breeding programs that have been actively breeding for resistance to EHP for several years now. Um, so anyway, I think that there's, um, this is just another piece of evidence that says, let's try to control EHP as a mechanism for controlling white feces. And then kind of a heads up, Gabrielle, in Latin America, that there's a reported incidence uh, in in Venezuela and something to be looking out for. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you, Dr. George. Uh, of course, uh, you know, we're already running short of time. I think other speakers have also expressed that, you know, some speakers have expressed they need to leave also. Uh, but of course, uh, our past president, Mr. Ravi Kumar, has been always saying that he's very inconclusive on the independent supply gap. Uh, I think if you open this discussion, it's going to be such a long time to complete this uh, because we're given due respect to the time zones from every people are here to attend. Uh, well, I thank all the speakers for spending your valuable time and uh, for all the participants who have been here. Uh, we try to answer to most of the questions. Uh, sorry if you're not able to attend to individual questions. We tried our best to pull up the questions and ask. So thanks to all the, all the people who have played a very major role in putting up this particular program and uh, to the panelists also. And now as a matter of, uh, uh, and Dr. George, thanks for your ch chipping in. And oh. uh, yes, go ahead. I wonder if I can mention one other thing. We will have a disease panel for the goal meeting, but the experts, uh, three of them are, are in Asia. And because of the time differences, we will have to pre-record that session. So I would greatly welcome any questions about shrimp diseases that you might wish to be answered in the goal panel to be, please send them to me and I will tee them up with uh, Locktran and Robbins McIntosh and others. So if, if you have further questions on shrimp diseases, please send them to me and then we will ask them in the disease panel, which must be pre-recorded, unfortunately, for the goal meeting. Okay, good. Thanks for this open offer. Appreciate it very much. Now, uh, I invite uh, our Mr. Dr. Ramesh, General Secretary SAP, to propose the vote of thanks. And I also thank the organizers and the president uh, to giving me an opportunity to moderate this session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Dr. You, sir. Ramesh. Yes, yes sir. Thank you. Uh, very, very good evening and good morning. Uh, honorable presenters, speakers, uh, my dear sapiens and my dear friends. Uh, it's been a very honor to be giving the vote of thanks. And uh, like, uh, I'm really honored that we had a very big lineup of speakers. We had like nine speakers and seven of them have been from various time zones. Either it's the early morning for them or a late evening for them. And I thank them for staying back. Uh, Dr. George Chamberlain, 
and uh, for your time to start up and then you come for the early presentation to do the trial angel rubio is not with us uh, willem vincent len mr pavan kumar uh, from uh, the yesterday's presenters today we had mr samson lee the ceo of grobus feeds mr harris uh, from cj feeds mr parish shetty avanti feeds thank you sirs and uh, last but not the least mr gabriel luna from ecodor it's a great country ecodor i really enjoy eating the ceviches out there and i think if you can launch your ceviches worldwide the consumption of shrimp will really go up and i think it will grow from 4 4 uh, pounds to i think at least 10 pounds so <laughs> the only thing which comes to my mind when i think of ecodor is the beautiful ceviches uh, so having said that like we had totally about 358 registered participants and of that yesterday we had 150 people plus join on the zoom and about 500 people on the youtube uh, today we had about 174 people on the zoom and 156 on the youtube i think for the reduced numbers today because we announced that this recorded version will be available so i think many people want to take the easy way out want to see the presentations at least here one at a time so i think that could be one of the reason why we have less people on the youtube today compared to yesterday and uh, i would like to say thanks to our events vice president mr malsudan reddy he tirelessly pushed for this event like i know for the last one month he has been very actively pushing to do this event and he has been behind he has been behind our past president uh, mr ravi kumar to get all these speakers together and the speakers have been very kind and helpful uh, for sparing their valuable time like yesterday and today we overshot the time and uh, you have stayed back i think uh, it's very late for mr samson lee so thank you very much sir for staying late i think george i think it's early part of your day but still i can see from your face like you're a little bit tense but thank you again for staying back and mr gabriel luna yourself also like uh, it shows that you care for the indian market and the indian aquaculture industry for sparing the time harris also like today he had some issues but still he stayed back i think it's almost if it was another day he would already be sleeping i guess like uh, thank you harris uh, for taking time we missed the opportunity of having you all here in person like we did the aqua india in january it would have been a great event but uh, i'm happy that we are able to meet virtually even though we are missing the personal touch it's been great day both the days yesterday and today and i'd like to thank the team of people who got all the speakers together our past president mr chandrashekar from grobes and um, uh, mr ravi kumar and also uh, the rest of the team from uh, sap our uh, treasurer mr vijayanand our general joint general secretary mr senthil they have been working together along with our uh, joint treasurer simon to get the zoom platform arranged i don't there have been some hiccups some uh, participants coming and telling that they are not able to log on there are some issues like it's a learning curve for us too also in sap like uh, we are trying to sort all these things uh, uh, and maybe the next event will be much more better and uh, thanks again for all of you for your valuable time i appreciate it and thanks again from team sap uh, to all of you and thank you participants for staying back both these days and uh, watching them on youtube thank you thanks again bye bye thank you bye.